When we say the word wealth, we're not just talking about money. We're also talking about time. And we're talking about the influence in the lives of the people you care about the most. Wealthy people, those who have a lot of money, time, and influence, didn't get there by taking the same path as everyone else. They thought differently. They made bold, unusual moves. And that's why they've accomplished what so few people accomplish. The goal of this podcast is to train you in the mindsets and the specific tactics of the wealthy so that you're fit and capable of producing wealth yourself. We want to help you get wealth fit. Let's go. Welcome back. As you know, it's my job to get inside the heads of successful investors and entrepreneurs and find out the mindset and the specific actions they took to create that success. And today we are talking about tax-free wealth. You got to pay attention on this because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep and taxes elude no one. Today we're talking with Tom Weir White, who is a rich dad advisor, which means he is top notch. We've had Andy Tanner on the show. We've had Robert Kiyosaki himself. And I am excited for you to hear from Tom Wheel right now. If you're just getting to know them, he is the best selling author behind multiple companies that specialize in wealth and tax strategy. He's also a leading expert and a published author on partnerships, corporation tax strategies and a well-known platform speaker and wealth education innovator. I am excited for you to hear this show because Tom gives us some incredible wisdom here, a lot of things that maybe your current advisor, your current team member might not be doing. And the best thing about today's show is that Tom takes something that is incredibly complex Maybe you even say, I'm not sure that I want to listen to a whole show about taxes. Let me tell you, he makes it simple. He makes it fun. He makes it exciting. And this show potentially could put more money back in your pocket just if you will communicate with the advisor that you're currently working with and share some of the things that you learn today on the show. We cover the gamut today. We talk about how you could make small tweaks that can actually help you reduce your taxes in anywhere from 10 to 40% in as little as three to five months. And I know that sounds crazy to some of you. I know that may sound big, but if that intrigues you just even a little iota, then you owe it to yourself to listen to this show. So with that said, let's get to it. Tom, you have a doctor that comes to you with a $750,000 tax bill. He already paid that, and that's because he hadn't met you. And you know, you would think this is a good thing because you're making a lot of money. I think most people would think, gosh, if you got a bill that high, it means you're making some good money. However, you're not content with that. You don't believe that just because you pay a lot of taxes, this is a good thing. So he works with you. You drop him down to $238,000 in taxes, which is a huge win. However, you're still not content, and so you whittle that away. You get that down to $52,000 in taxes, and you're still not content because your idea, as you mentioned, is tax-free wealth. How in the heck are you able to whittle down someone's bill like this? And does that little voice, do you ever get that hate mail or stuff like that? Like, oh, if you're American, you should be paying taxes so that – you know, you can contribute to the roads and society. What's the whole backstory to this? Oh, my heavens. You're just going to get me going here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right off the bat. You are going to get me going Let's here. Let's do it. So worst advice I ever hear, and I hear it all the time. Somebody goes, well, I was told that if I want to pay less tax, I need to make less money. That is seriously the dumbest thing I ever hear. And I hear it all the time. It just is shocking to me. I'm going, look, why would you ever want to make less money? The reality is, the tax law is a series of incentives. Like it or not, it is. So you can not like it, not pay attention and pay a lot of tax. Or you can go, oh, that's kind of cool. What incentives are there for me? So doctors are really tough because doctors don't have a lot of incentives, right? So we actually have to change the nature of how this doctor made his money and what he was investing in. And the very first thing we did, of course, I always look at last year's tax returns and Oddly enough, we actually found a mistake, which we don't find very often. And he'd been taxed a certain way on a part of his income, which was completely incorrect. 
And so he was already a kind of a minor real estate investor. And what he learned was, is that, you know, investors, professional investors get all the tax breaks. And so we actually developed a strategy for him to build his wealth and reduce his taxes all at the same time. And it's actually, as you build wealth, the faster you build wealth, the fewer taxes you pay, because it kind of goes like this. The more money you earn, the more taxes you pay. The more assets you acquire, the less taxes you pay. So if you want to pay less tax, acquire more assets. And that's not me talking. That's the internal revenue code. Okay. That's in every single country. The governments work the same way. They're looking at, look, there are certain things we want to encourage certain activities, whether it's investment in housing, whether it's um, investment in business, whether it's creating jobs. These are all things the government wants to do, whether it's controlling the climate. Maybe it's uh, like research and development. Every single government, every country I've ever been to, and I travel all over, you travel all over the world, every single country I've ever been to has a massive research and development tax benefit. The U.S. actually has the worst of any country. Really? And, oh yeah, for example, in South Africa, you spend $100, you get to deduct 150 Hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Right. You don't deduct a hundred, you deduct 150. All right. And that's actually fairly common, that kind of a tax benefit. I mean, it's amazing. Well, what the government's saying is in South Africa, we'd like you to do your research and development here in South Africa. Mm. We don't want you to do it in China. We don't want you to do it in the US. We don't want to export our inventors. We don't want to export our research and development. We want to do it here and we will pay you to do it. So, you know, the reality is the government's your partner, like it or not. So you can be the partner that pays 50 or 60% in tax. You can be the partner who pays 0% in tax. You get to choose. This It's not like it's unfair. It's not like one person gets to choose it and the other person doesn't. We have what's called equal protection under the law in the U.S., which is in the Constitution. So you can't have laws applied differently to different people. What you can have is different laws that apply to different people. So the same law has to apply equally to everybody. And what that means is, is that if you say, oh, well, you know, the tax laws are made for the rich. Okay, so why don't you start behaving like the rich and get right. the tax benefits? It's really just a, a function of changing your behavior. Why are people so stymied by this, right? You hear, I was going to save this for later, but let's get into it now. You know, 6,000 pages of New tax codes added, right? And I don't even know how big the book is or if it's even in one single book anymore. But, you know, obviously with all that, people just seem to be folded by this. They seem to be paying more than, than they should be doing. What's the problem here? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fundamentally it's financial education. I mean, that's the problem mm. is that, you know, they've grown up without any financial education. The schools don't teach financial education because look who's teaching it. I mean, they don't understand it. Right. The teacher don't understand it. Even if you take a business class in high school, what are you going to get? How to balance a checkbook? I mean, who cares? That's what software is for is to balance my checkbook. I don't need to know how to do that. So you have this complete lack of financial education and then people are scared to death of the IRS. And I think that's, there's really a lot of fear mongering. Yeah. When it comes to taxes, you know, people are uncomfortable with numbers. And they're uncomfortable with complexity. And there's nothing that's a bigger set of complex numbers than the tax law. So it's actually why I love the tax law, because when I was a kid, I always loved numbers. Numbers were really super easy for me. And then I took a business law class in high school. and I'm going, this is really cool. So in college, I'm going, do I go to law school? But then I decided I do not like lawyers. So I don't want to <laughs> spend my life with lawyers. So I'm talking to my tax professor. I said, what do I do? Because he was a lawyer. I said, what do I do is Professor Haney. And he see, he goes, well, if you really want to do tax, what you need to do is get a master's of accounting in tax. I said, great. And he said, I said, where do I go? He says, well, the best school in the world is University of Texas. So go down there. And so that's what I did. The thing is, is that taxes don't have to be so complex. The details are complex. That's what accountants are for, right? But the concepts are really, really simple. You know, if you want to know what your government wants you to do, look at the tax law. Now, you're right. I mean, our, just the tax law itself is over 6,000 pages. In Great Britain, it's over 12,000. Wow. So we like, we're half as good as Great Britain. <laughs> right? And then Canada is half of us. So there's much simpler in Canada. 
But the reality is, is that most of the tax law is just this instruction guide to have to reduce your taxes. That's what it is. You have one line that says all income's taxable unless we say it isn't. Another line that says nothing's deductible unless we say it is. It's literally that simple. When I teach CPAs, because I teach CPAs on a regular basis, I give them that line. They go, yeah, that, that's right. And I'm going, then why are you, we actually came up with a name for it. Why are you complexifying things? You complexify like right? yeah. that. That's yeah. our word we made up was you're complexifying it. Why don't you simplify it instead? And you know, there's one other thing, if I could, you have professional advisors, whether they're tax advisors, legal advisors, financial advisors, and they have this theory and their theory kind of goes like this. Well, I've spent all my life studying my subject. And if I tell you what I know, you won't need me anymore. Hmm. And I call that the black box theory of advice, right? I've got this black box. I need to keep it black. I can't let you in. Well, we just have a different philosophy. My philosophy is, okay, if I teach you what I know, let me ask, are you going to be more successful or less successful? More. More successful. Okay. So if you're more successful, you're going to make more money or less money? More. Okay. You're going to make more money. So if you make more money, your life is going to tend to get more complex, right? Absolutely. You're going to have all these different companies and all these different investments. And guess what that means? More work for me. So it's totally selfish. Okay. I just believe that the more successful clients are, the more they actually are going to use me and need me. And of course, they're going to refer more people to me as well. But mostly it's, I want them to be successful because if I can take a doctor, by the way, that's the hardest person in the world to reduce their taxes. And part of it is because a lot of doctors, frankly, think they know everything and they don't need anybody else. <laughs> um, <laughs> seriously, my wife, Luann, is a, um, she's a CPA and she has a, her own CPA firm. And she will not take a doctor on as a client. Wow. And wow. in fact, this doctor we're talking about was actually at her house the other day. Um, he'd flown in actually to help me with something. And she, she's telling him, I said, now, because I'm setting her up, right? And I said, so Luann won't take doctors. And she's telling the story about this surgeon and, and you know, how he's just been, was so horrible to her and he really didn't need any help and everything. And she goes, so what kind of medicine do you practice? She says, I'm a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> and she shoots daggers at me. Here. She goes, you set me up. And I yeah, said, she walked into that Totally. One. I totally set that up <laughs> because I actually forgot the doctor she was talking about was a surgeon. Mm. But I knew the doctor that was in our house, he, I knew he was a surgeon. It was pretty funny. That, um, <laughs> so doctors are tough. I mean, yeah. they're because the law actually doesn't favor them. The law doesn't favor professionals and it doesn't favor employees. It favors business owners and investors. Well, this doctor, to his credit, is the exception that proves the rule. And what he does is every single piece of advice I've ever given one, he like goes the extra mile with it. Hmm. So he's out there. I mean, he's taking trips. This guy works 60 hours a week. And he's taking trips to learn about real estate investing, to learn about oil and gas. He's meeting all these people. I mean, he goes on this cruise. I'm just going, this is amazing. And he's actually implementing every single thing I tell him to do. And he's doing it over and over again. So when I looked at his tax projection this year, I saw how low his taxes were going to be. I'm just like, wow, I had no idea you'd done all this. And we talk on a regular basis and I still didn't know he'd done all this. And we're going to get them to tax free. We're going to get them tax free pretty quick. Tom, you have this amazing ability to take, you know, a somewhat complicated, some may say a boring subject, right? But you got a big grin on your face right now because you understand the power of it. And I want to get into that. I want to show people what you know about tax free wealth, how to find the right team. But before we do, I want to go back a little bit because you're uncommon. You're not like the typical CPA. Thank you. You are not the typical guy. And I got to think that goes back to childhood. And so, you know, I've got an opportunity to get to know you and you grew up in a family biz. How do you think that shaped your life? And uh, let the Wealth Fit Nation know like what that story is. So I was very fortunate. So my dad and his brother, when they were young, they wanted to start a business. Now, my dad loved printing. He loved photography and printing and everything. And my uncle was a musician. And he'd actually done his doctoral work on how to print music a different way. And so their father, my grandfather, gave them the seed money to start this business. Hmm. My uncle was really a better businessman 
than my dad was. My dad was more artistic, but they worked very well together. My dad managed the plant and my uncle ran the business. And so they were partners for 30 odd years. Wow. Built actually a fairly sizable printing company that really did a lot of four color work, which is back then that was a big deal. Now, I mean, you wouldn't even have printers like them anymore. Okay. They mm. were lithographers. It was very much an art. And all of the kids in my family, there's six of us. I'm the youngest of six. And all of us worked in the business. And so like I had a brother who worked in the press room. I had another brother who worked in the art room. And my sister worked in the art room. I worked, I know shockingly, I worked in the accounting department. <laughs> and uh, and my mother was the controller. Okay. So my mother and I had a very special relationship. We were friends. It was not, my mother was never motherly. Mm. She's not your typical mother, great yeah. cook, all this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, uh. She was brilliant. She graduated from high school when she was 15. Wow. She graduated from high school. She started high school as a 12-year-old. Wow. And so she, she like accelerated through school. My dad did also. He also graduated from high school at 15. So they're really, really smart people and very focused on education. My mother, so my mother was a voracious reader. And we just were friends. I mean, she was a tennis player. She taught me how to play tennis. We played tennis together, uh -huh. you know, to be able to work in the business with her. So after school, I would go down and, and I'd actually fill out invoices and I'd do the, the accounts payable and the accounts receivable. And I would do some shipping and I got to be a really expert package wrapper, which is very handy at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really good with a very small amount of tape. And it's a little unknown fact about me little skill set that I developed uh, wrapping packages for my dad and his business. It really gave us, a, I think all of us, a different feel for the business. My brothers and I all went into business of some sort. Mm. My oldest brother was a Harvard business professor. Wow. And my next oldest brother actually wrote the very first tutorial for Word. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, Epic family. And uh, my brother that's closest in age to me developed the first factory in China that is FDA approved making drugs. Wow. And so, yeah, I'm like the runt of the litter. If you, you kind of get the idea, I'm sure. the runt of the litter here, right? I'm the <laughs> you're only, no slouch I'm either, the only one without a PhD, right? <laughs> and not only do they have PhDs, which some people say is, stands for poor, helpless, and desperate, they're rich. So every one of them makes a lot more money than I do. <laughs> and they, they've been very successful investors. I mean, I remember when my oldest brother of Harvard Business School, he says, you know, you should look at this little company called Apple. I'm on the board hmm. and it's a good company. Hmm. And so, you know, he's getting options and investing right. and just going, he's got all the inside scoop on this company, right? This little company called Apple, because that was like 30 years ago. Wow. Right? Is when Apple was small and uh, he was on the board and he was on the board of all these companies that are now just mega giants and Family businesses are great. I mean, greater for some than others. Yeah. <laughs> They're great. No doubt. I mean, you come from a, an incredible family. You decided you're going to University of Utah, right? Right. You got that right. And then yep, you, yep. you go to UT. You mentioned that. Yep. Did you know that you would come back around to entrepreneurship or did you kind of go a different path than? You know, it's interesting because I really, I mean, I loved school. I was really good at it. I mean, I'm an A student. I call myself a recovering A student. And I really enjoyed because I loved learning. And I had a tax professor at the University of Texas, Sally Jones. She goes, the best thing about tax is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you're learning every single day. And I love to learn. I mean, I'm just like a voracious learner. And so I got the opportunity to go back to the national office of Ernst & Young and spend three years back there with really the biggest brains in the business and learn at their feet. And I learned how to write back there because they're attorneys and they ripped me up on my writing. Hmm. They were without mercy. Okay. They just absolutely pushed, 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 pushed. By the third year I was there, I was a, I'd actually developed pretty good writing skills and they actually allowed me to actually write my own stuff. So, you know, and then I did a lot of teaching because I've always loved to teach. So I did kind of stay the employee route. You know, I was seven years with Ernst and Young. I was another four years with a what's uh, you call Fortune 1000 company now. So I was really 13 years yeah. out of school before I started my business. And the only reason I started is because Price Warehouse fired me. Mm. So I'm, I'm like out on the street and I have two young kids and I'm the sole provider, right? So 
I told my then wife, mother of my children, I said, I'm just going to start my own business. And she said, go for it. You wow. Know? I actually had friends come to me and said, we just thought it was about time. And so I didn't know it. And so, you know what? I think that when, like when I got fired by Price Waterhouse, yeah. that was the universe saying, this is not the right place for you. That's what it was. And it was a horrible time. Oh my heavens, literally worst seven months of my life. And not necessarily their fault. It's just a bad fit. Mm-hmm. And so when they, I felt, hindsight, I can say, when they fired me, they released me. Yeah. Is what yeah. happened. And so at that point, they gave me actually a pretty nice severance because they felt guilty about it, mm-hmm. which they should have, but they felt guilty <laughs> about it. And so I had some time available and I just said, you know what? I've seen other accountants. I'm at least as smart as they are. If they can do this, I can do this. I'd kept a couple of clients that I'd served to Ernst & Young. They let me keep a couple of clients. Wow. When I left and one of them, I did his business and investing taxes and he had a, another CPA do his personal taxes. Hmm. And I went up and I talked to this personal CPA and I'm going, this guy is not that bright. And yet he's driving a car that is much newer and much nicer than mine. Mm-hmm. I'm going, hmm. So that's when I'm going, wait a minute, I can do this. I had a buddy that came to me and he said, look, I will actually, there's a practice, a CPA practice for sale. I will fund it for you. My son made all this money in software and he's got all this extra money and I will lend you the money. Put up, you know, mortgages on my house and everything else I owned, right? Right. My, right arm of my oldest child, right? So, I mean, he, literally he, you know, he, he forced that issue, but he gave me that opportunity. And once I had that and I uh, moved into an office and somebody I'd met while I was actually scrounging for work actually offered me a, an office in his suite for 250 bucks a month. And Take it. I took it and I'll tell you what, I mean, I just got so much work after that because people realized I was serious about being in business. Right. And then it just flourished. And within a year, I was just overwhelmed with work and brought in more people. And within a few years, we had 10. And I mean, it's, you know, now we have literally clients all over the world. So it's actually a little too bad that it took me so long. (laughs) Hey, Um, it's all the path, right? At the same time, I would not have been as good at the tax side of it as I am now had I taking any kind of shortcuts because, I mean, I was an adjunct professor for 14 years. And so I got that experience. I did state and local taxes, which I'd never done before. I was always a real estate guy and I did state and local tax. So that was a Fortune 1000 company because they didn't have any income tax at that time because they'd had some big losses. So it's all for our good, right? It's all good experience. Frankly, I wouldn't trade any of it because it brings us where we are. Tom, you're a Rich Dad advisor. We've had Robert on the show. We're big fans, uh, Andy Tanner as well on the show. And so I'm always curious because I'm here today because of that book. I'm always curious to hear the the good old Rich Dad story. So what's yours? <laughs> when did you come across the book in the journey? Uh, so I have a very different story. Okay. All right. So 2001, my business had grown so much that I'd brought on a partner and I'd actually ended up with three partners. So there were four of us. And I went through a nasty partnership breakup with Mm. this guy. I mean, it was really nasty. So clients went with the other partners, but all the staff stayed with me. Mm. Okay. And so I have all these good staff and I only like have half the work, right? (laughs) So I'm going, I don't want to fire good staff because it's so hard to find and train good staff. Right. So I kind of put that out in the universe. It's kind of the way I would put it now. It's not what I was thinking then, but that's kind of the way I put it. And I get this postcard in the mail and it says CPA firms for sale. And so I called on it and they had this CPA firm in Phoenix that did a lot of consulting. Well, not a lot of CPA firms do consulting, tax consulting. And so I checked into it and oh my heavens, these clients were, not only were they the right kind of clients, but one of them was an old friend of mine. Hmm. And she was able to tell me all the inside scoop on the practice. She was an insurance agent and she'd actually helped build the practice And she was thrilled that I had taken over because the accountant I was buying it from kind of let things go. Mm -hmm. She'd gotten distracted by other business interests. And so I bought the practice. Well, I'm looking at the client list and one of the clients is this fellow by name of Robert Kiyosaki. And so I tell people that I bought Robert. I paid good (laughs) money for him. Because that's what you're doing. You're buying a client list, right? Right, That's what you're paying for. And so I met Robert through the seller of the accounting firm, it's an amazing story because she decided to kind of go off on her own and she had been doing a lot of rich debt stuff herself. 
and uh, had been on stage with Robert and then toured with Robert. And she decided she was going to do her own thing. She was a star in her own right. She was going to do her own thing. And she left the week before they had a three-day event. And, of course, Robert wasn't too happy about that. I right? Bet. I mean, I wouldn't be either. And so my business partner and I, we decide, my new business partner, we decide we're going to go attend the event along with her husband. So the three of us attend this event. First day, Robert's talking about depreciation on real estate. And he says, so I'm going to have my other accountant come out up right now and explain depreciation. Now, let's put this in perspective. He'd never seen me on stage before. He had no idea I had any experience whatsoever. He didn't even know I knew what I was talking about when it came to depreciation. So he took this, in in my mind, he took this enormous risk. Right. And I got there and I started talking about the magic of depreciation. And he was like, wow, this is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we just hit it off and I did some stuff together. We kind of had some ins and outs just because um, they brought some other people in to run the company and they brought their own CPA in. But about... uh, 2008. So that's what many, many years ago yeah, yeah. that we got back together because I was actually taking a course he was doing. He actually had a new CEO and the new CEO said, would you actually come in and handle our taxes? Hmm. And I said, absolutely. And then, then he wanted me to be a rich advisor. And, and he said, but you have to write a book. <laughs> I said, great, I can do that. And so I did. 2012, I released Tax-Free Wealth that was literally, an, it was on the bestseller list before it was actually released. Really? Yeah. So it's been number one in its category for since it was released 2012. It's pretty amazing to have a book like that because yeah. I had no idea how big of an impact that would have on people. Because I didn't know anything about Reset Poor Dad. I mean, I'd never read it until I was told that, well, you should read this book because this guy's one of your new clients. That's right. So I go read the book and actually my buddy had just become the CFO for Rich Dad. Huh. And so I get this card about the same time looking at buying this practice. I have this card from George and he goes, I just want to let you know, I've got this new job and CFO of Rich Dad. So I'm calling George and he's giving me all the scoop about Rich Dad. And I'm calling, I'm calling my other friend who's a client of the CPA firm. I'm going, it was just meant to be. I was just going to say, this seems like destiny. Like <laughs> so many like, things in your life pointing in this direction. I, I, I got to tell you. So Robert and I have been traveling really regularly since about 2012. We travel all over the world together, and we typically travel the world uh, once or twice every single year, literally around the world. Robert's a very generous guy, and he's brilliant, as you know. Yep. Best teacher I've ever seen, and really can make things simple. The greatest thing I've gotten from him is he's forced me to simplify it. So, you know, Mm. you talk about, you know, I say things a lot more simply about taxes. I make taxes a lot more simple. Some of that I have to just attribute to Robert because he, like, it's not that he came up with it, it's that he pounded on me yeah. until I came up with it, right? I mean, we did this, um, oh my heavens, a couple of years ago, he had us all do TED Talks. We were just writing him. It's not like we were going to do a TED Talk. He right. just wants to do a short 20-minute talk, right? So I get up and he says, okay, I want an audience. So we're in their studio. And I bring 12 of my staff. This is a Saturday morning and they volunteer to come. Mm-hmm. They can't wait to see this, Right. And Robert says to me before we start, he goes, Tom, you are really brave. <laughs> You've got 12 of your staff here. <laughs> and we're, yeah. So I'd put it out. And anybody who wanted to come could come. So I'm like, I got this all prepared. I spent weeks and weeks preparing this TED Talk. I'm like two minutes in it. <laughs> and he says, stop. <laughs> and he goes, okay, you got to get rid of all of that. <laughs> Except I like the video. I want you to do it completely differently. I said, that's a terrible story. Don't tell that story. You know, he's just pounding on me and he's turning to the audience and says, see now, right? I mean, this is terrible, isn't it? And these are my staff. <laughs> right. What are they? Right. They're in a rock and a hard place. And they're, oh no, they were like, they were, oh yeah, this is wrong. I mean, you should do this and this and this. We spent four hours together and it was the really the best four hours ever because mm. what it did was able, allow me to create this much more simple way of delivering the message. Yeah than I ever had before. And it's kind of been my go-to message um, since then. And it was brilliant. And I, I got to say, I mean, how many people get a tutorial, one-on-one tutorial from Robert Kiyosaki yeah. on presenting your, doing your presentation from stage? I mean, it's amazing. That's awesome. I want to get into that. So I, I want to get into your gift, which is, you know, really showing people how to get levels of uh, tax-free wealth. And so 
One of the things I heard you say today in the studio while recording the course that you're creating for us is change your facts, change your tax. And it just called to me. It sounds very simple. Maybe that came out of your session there. But what do you mean by that? Change your facts. How can one change what is true? Well, you know, it actually goes back to the OJ trial, right? If, it, if, <laughs> if the glove doesn't fit, you must have quit. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and so a few years ago, I'm actually telling this. I'm going, really, the difference between whether something's de- deductible or not, Mm -hmm. you know, people always come up to me and say, is this like, is this table deductible? Is this microphone deductible? I'm going, I don't know. It depends. Well, there's a better question. And the question is, how do I make it deductible? And that really gets to the essence of the matter. How do I make something deductible? How do I make something beneficial to me tax-wise? And so my very first client that I had that I was telling you about, I, I had two clients, right, when I started out. And the very first one, he was a real estate developer. And we go into a meeting one day with an attorney. And this is about a deal that he's doing. And the attorney's just saying, well, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. And we come out and he turns to me. He says, Tom, he says, there are two types of attorneys in the world. There's deal makers and deal breakers. He goes, what do you think this one is? I said, oh, this is a deal breaker. And I took that to heart because I'm going, you know what? That's true with all advisors. There are deal makers and deal breakers. And the deal makers always look at, how do I make this happen? I've never yet had a client who wanted me to tell them what they could not deduct. <laughs> never have I ever been asked, what can I not deduct? The question is always, what can I deduct? Yeah. And so I just changed the, I just changed the question, which the real question is, how can I deduct everything I have, everything I spend money on? And it's very simple. I mean, there's just simple rules to deducting. I mean, it's got to be a business expense. It's got to be ordinary and necessary, and you got to have to document it. I mean, it's not rocket science. I mean, the rules are very clear in the case law. Okay, this isn't something, by the way, you read in the Internal Revenue Code. There's nowhere in the Internal Revenue Code it says that it has to have a business purpose, ordinary, necessary, and you have to document it. I mean, that's all in regulations, case law, et cetera. But my job is to read all that stuff and distill it down so that my clients and the public, frankly, How much did you learn in school about building wealth? I'm talking real world strategies that you're actually using today to get yourself out of debt, make more money, invest for your family's future, grow your own business. Look, if you're like me, you hardly learn any of these practical wealth building skills in school. So that's why WealthFit exists. We've gone out and found over 40 of the most successful investors and entrepreneurs and people out there. Folks like Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad Poor Dad, Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank, Danica Patrick, the most successful female race car driver in history, and now an incredible entrepreneur. Best-selling author and owner of the NBA's Atlanta Hawks, Jesse Itzler, former NFL football player, and now one of the top real estate investors in the nation, Than Merrill, and many, many more. And we've worked with each of these wealthy people to produce many lessons, audio training, and most importantly, life-changing online video courses for you on what it takes to achieve success and build real, lasting wealth for yourself and your family. There's really nothing like it. To create a free account and start learning now, just go to wealthfit.com slash free. That's wealthfit.com slash free. I'm taking courses on WealthFit myself every single day, and you should too. Go to wealthfit.com slash free. Now back to the show. Can understand that this is how you make something deductible. And it's pretty simple. Let's move into the hot topic. I bet if we have folks from your industry, your ilk, brethren, CPAs and whatnot, they might cringe a little bit here, but I want to talk a little home office because we're sitting in the studio and uh, many of us here at WellFit have had businesses or have businesses. And I think we've all heard, do not do the home office because it's going to raise that little old red flag and you don't want big brother looking at your stuff. And so you have a different point of view. And so will you share? Yeah. I do. Soapbox time, right? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, home office is a deduction that is specifically identified in the law, and there's very specific rules on how to take it. So it's not a gray area. It's black and white. You can take a home office if you meet these rules. So I want to deduct my home office. Great. Meet the rules. It's not rocket science. The rules go like this, 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 and this. Well, what happens is, is that if you go, well, I don't, I cringe at the idea of an IRS audit. Well, I'm going to tell all the listeners right now how to never fear an IRS audit. Is that okay? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so can you help me out here? I'll play along, absolutely. Okay, so here you go. You repeat after me. I will never. I will never. Speak to. Speak to. The IRS. The IRS. <laughs> done. <laughs> because look, you should not have to speak to the IRS. You hire professionals like me to do that. I have way more training than any IRS auditor. I have more time. I have more experience. I've read the law more. I've had more clients. I've had more clients than they've had audits. So it's a little bit like for me, it's a game, right? This is all game. Right. You understand that, right? You see me just get all excited about taxes because it's a game. It's just my game, right? So it's a little like, okay, so think of yourself as a high school basketball player and you're going up against a college player. That's tough, right? I yeah. mean, there's a big yeah. difference between high school players and college players right. as a general rule. Not all of them. Right. LeBron James. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Kobe yeah. Bryant. Accepted, yeah, yeah. Ex- accepted, but there's a big difference, right? You're going up this college player. Well, you have a choice. Let's say you have a choice. You can go up against them or you can go hire LeBron James to go up for you. What would you do? <laughs> I'm just going LeBron every time. Well, yeah, duh. Right. And yet here you are, you're trying to handle your IRS audit on your own and you're not even a high school basketball player, right? (laughs) You're a Saturday morning basketball player, right? right? You're a weekend warrior and you're going up against this college player, but that's all they are. They're not a professional player. They're a college player. So what do you do? You go, okay, let me bring in the big guns because guess what? You can substitute in. Mm. It's called the power of attorney and you never have to talk to the IRS. You never have to worry about it. And I kind of, actually, I shouldn't admit this, but I think IRS audits are kind of fun <laughs> because they're outgunned and they don't know it. And my job is to make their job easier. I have enormous respect for IRS auditors. I tease a lot about IRS auditors, but the reality is they have, I think, one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Because think about this. What if you're in business and all your best customers hated you and never wanted to see you? Mm. That's what they're up against. I mean, it is a really tough job. It makes being a proctologist seem beautiful, (laughs) right? They have people don't want to see them. None of their customers want to see them. And so I respect them and I treat them really, really well. I had an IRS auditor once come to me and she'd actually done the audit for the business. And one of the shareholders was my client, not the business. And she told me that they, was she auditing the business, that the CPA was handling the business was so mean to her, he made her cry. Can you imagine making an IRS auditor cry? Wow. And I said, you will not have that issue here. We will take good care. By the end, she actually asked me to write her report for her because it was something she didn't understand. I understood it better. I took the time to explain it to her. Well, the rest of the story is that CPA who'd made her cry was my former partner. <laughs> That's the reason he, it was former. Wow. Um, because he had that effect on people. And yeah. so I just... You know, you treat them with respect, Sure, but I know how to do that. And the reality is, is if an IRS auditor asks you a question, you can't say, I don't know, because you'll look bad. Yeah. I can say, I don't know. Let me ask my client. Mm -hmm. So it's much easier for me to deal with it. It's not emotional to me. Yeah. It's a game to me. I'm a professional. So it's much easier for me to handle than for a a client. So really my number one advice is just don't worry about IRS. Don't worry about it's, it's a red flag. Your tax preparer should be your tax advisor and they should make it, they should be able to actually, first of all, they should be able to take your home office deduction without it being a red flag Mm -hmm. because there's no reason for it to be a red flag. It's only because of lazy tax preparers. I think it becomes a red flag and it's a legitimate deduction. So why would you not take it? I mean, if your tax return preparer or tax advisor is afraid of the IRS, you should just say next I think that was one of the greatest things I heard today. The other thing that I thought was interesting when you shared this with me was this was a rule a long time ago, this home office thing that has since been changed and the stigma still sticks around. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, yeah. What happened was uh, there was a court case in the uh, Mm mid-90s. The court allowed a doctor who had a home office to take the home office deduction even though he made his rounds at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And in 1997, they actually – put that into the law. They actually changed the Internal Revenue Code. And instead of relying on case law, now they said, look, IRS, you have to allow this. And they put in very specific rules. And so really, since 1997, there's no reason for the home office to even be a red flag. It's really a matter of how you report it on the tax return and you have options. And most people don't realize that not all tax preparers are created equal. Sure. That how you report something, a simple example, you do a lot, I mean, wealth fit. 
Yeah. Financial education, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you do a seminar and somebody mm. comes to your seminar. If they record seminar on their tax return, that's a red flag. Mm. But it, let's say they're a real estate investor. So it's actually continuing education. And you record as continuing education, not a red flag. Yep. Seminar red flag, continuing education, not a red flag. So that's a very simple example, but it's pretty easy if you know what you're doing. I want to go to the classic question that you must get in every other CPA, which is, Tom, are you aggressive or are you conservative? Oh, you, I, that's a, such a softball thing. <laughs> a lot of people say, I want a more aggressive accountant. Right, yeah. What they're really saying is, is, I want an accountant who understands more of the law. Yeah, yeah. Because I look at it, so I was laughing because you've had Danica Patrick, right? Yeah, in yeah. your On the show. Yeah. I think she's amazing. Okay, she's beautiful Agreed. and she's amazing. Yeah, I agree. Right? And you put her out on the racetrack, she's fearless. Mm-hmm. You put me on the racetrack, I'm a hazard. <laughs> So that's just a function of knowledge and experience. That's all that is. Um, I actually use her all the time when I'm teaching. I use her as an example because here's the first woman to be a successful race car driver. Right. And it's no big deal to her. For me, it's a big deal. I mean, I've actually been out on that racetrack. Yeah. But not in a real race, just a pretend one. And it's pretty nerve wracking. It's really hard to do that. And so I really appreciate professionals. You know, the more education you have, the more experience you have the more professional you can become. And so to me, being aggressive versus conservative, it's really more, the more I know, the more I can be conservative and at the same time do for, more for my clients. Aggressive just means I'm out of my comfort zone. I just don't want to do anything out of my comfort zone. So I'm actually very conservative. I just do a lot more because I have a much bigger comfort zone. That's tricky because I think a lot of people use that question to gauge up their professional and it's not the right question to there ask, to questions. gauge. Yeah. There are well, better questions. I want to get into that. So let's talk about team because you're big on team, right? Huge. And I know people, the big questions they have is how do I find the right professional? How do I vet them? How do I know that they're good? And then I really want to get to, so we, let's do those, is how do you lead this professional? So it's one thing to kind of just hire somebody and abdicate and, yeah. and not check in, but to right. really control your wealth, you got to lead. So how do we find them or who first is on the team? Let's well, go. it's actually really simple. Who's on your team? You need a bunch of people on your team. You've yeah. got to have a good bookkeeper. You've got to have a good tax advisor. You've got to have a good attorney. You've got to have a good banker. You've got to have a good insurance agent. You have to have good property managers. I mean, you know, there's all these different people you need on your yeah. team. So I wrote a whole chapter of it in my book, Tax Free Wealth, Chapter 23, about how to find the right tax advisor. And when I was writing the book, Robert said, Kiyosaki, he said, would you please put in the top 10 questions that you need to ask when you're interviewing a tax advisor? And I said, sure, I'm happy to do that. Let me explain, though. The questions you ask them are not nearly as important as the questions they ask you. Mm. The job of an advisor is to ask good questions. If you go to the doctor and your stomach hurts, what does the doctor spend all the time doing? Asking questions. Asking, Asking questions, questions to diagnose what's the solution. Well, if your advisor is not diagnosing and finding out what's the solution, how can they possibly know what the solution is? So to me... And I think it's pretty easy to, we can pretty easily judge whether it's a good question or a bad question. I yeah. mean, people say there's no stupid question. There's lots of stupid <laughs> questions. I get them asked them all the time. I've got $10,000. How should I invest it? That's a stupid question. Okay. Better question is, how do I become a professional investor? Better question. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's kind of like the soup question. There's a, an old movie, Finding Forster, and the, the mentor t is teaching the young athlete about Actually, he's a writer, right? The young athlete is. And the mentor is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. And this young guy says, oh, so why don't you write anymore? He says, that's a dumb question. But then one day he says, how come your soup has a skin on it and mine doesn't? And the played by Sean Connery. And the mentor says, that's a good question. Mm. He says, and it's very simple. I put milk in my soup. Your mother didn't have the money to put milk in her soup. And that's why it's a film on it. But what you're asking is, is why? Yeah. To me, the why questions are the best questions. The why and the how. How can I? How can I make this deductible? How can I make turn my children into assets? How can I lower my tax rate? How can I? How can I? How can I? How can I? And then why or why not? Okay, why does it work this way? Why doesn't it work this way? All right, if you understand those things, now life is easy. Tom, I want to go back to something earlier in the day that, that you shared. I just, I found it fascinating. I'm so giddy to share because uh, I don't think a lot of people hear this. 
I didn't realize this. And so you talk about tax brackets. Yep. And so, you know, many people have heard this and those that make a lot of money in a higher, a higher tax bracket. And so one of the strategies that I recall you sharing was you can change or you can move your tax bracket, especially if you have kids. And it's, interestingly enough, if you have uh, parents. So will you share, give a little inside baseball on what you mean sure. here? Sure. So most people don't understand tax brackets and we don't have time to explain it here. Mm-hmm. Suffice it to say that the highest tax bracket is 37% in the U.S. right now, and the lowest is zero. Okay, first $12,000 is zero. That's your tax bracket. And then it goes up 10% and 12% until you get to 37%. Everybody has all of those brackets. That's where people get, people think, well, if I get this bonus, it pushes me to high bracket. So now all my income's taxed that bracket. Uh uh uh. It's just the extra income that's yeah. taxed in that bracket, which means that the last dollar you earn is taxed at your highest bracket. And the first deduction you get is deducted at your highest bracket. That's an important distinction mm-hmm. because if you can deduct money and move it to somebody who's in, only has a lower bracket, that's a permanent tax savings. Well, the people that are most obvious are your children because all children have a $12,000 zero tax bracket. You have to pay them. They have to actually work in your business or your investments to do it. But if you do, you can deduct the money and so you're deducting at 37%. They're paying tax at 0%. Yeah. People will say, well, I don't have children. Well, do you have elderly parents that you're taking care of? Yeah, I do. Well, you can do the same thing with them because guess what? They also have tax brackets. <laughs> so everybody's got a tax bracket. I mean, I always say this isn't rocket science. The reality is it probably is, but it's not that hard. It's the right advice, the right financial education. It's not that hard to make serious dents. I had a guy, I'm in South Africa talking about this little planning strategy of paying your kids. I'd made sure that it was legal, first of all, in South Africa, and sure enough. And so I talk about this on stage. This guy says, you just saved me 70,000 rand. Okay, so mm-hmm. that's like $5,000, right? So he's like, I can't believe you just saved me all this money. He goes, I can do that. And I'm going, it's, that, it's really that simple. It's not that hard. You know, there's something I, I do want to bring up too, because it, I just – cringe when I hear it. And um, I want people that maybe have this mindset to change this mindset. And so, you know, you were sharing, you you speak all around the world and you were given strategies and you're like, Tom, this is great. I, I love this stuff, but it, it just won't work here. This doesn't work in my market. You know, the what I say is people say you can't do this here. And, and my answer is, well, you can't do it here. <laughs> the reality is, is there are people doing this here. Let me get a quick story. Mm-hmm. So Robert and I are in, in Moscow, Russia. And we're invited to this dinner by the sponsors of the event. And there are 10 really top-notch business owners in Moscow end up talking about taxes, of course, because what else would you want to talk about? (laughs) And we're going around the room and everyone was saying, well, the story is in Russia. You ask a Russian about laws and they said, well, you know, kind of laws are just suggestions. (laughs) (laughs) That's kind of the, the idea, right? So these guys are saying, well, look, we pay employees, some over the table, some under the table, because that's what we have to do. We get to the one who's the wealthiest guy in the room. Mm. And he said, I don't have any employees. I have independent contractors. And independent contractors, we don't have that issue. So what he's done is he's followed the rules. Now he's obeying the law and he pays no tax while they're paying tax on like 70% of the income. Right. He's paying tax on none of it because he's figured out what the rules are. It doesn't matter if you're in Moscow. He was doing it there. Mm-hmm. The others weren't. Yeah. You know, so you come up and say, you can't do this here. And I just want to say, just let's correct that. When you point a finger, you got three pointing back at you and you can't do that here. Would you like to learn how to do it here? And it's just a matter of being open and willing to learn. That's the power of education. That's why we do here. That's why we do what we do. Absolutely. I want to move us into WellFit Round, which essentially is rapid fire, just a fancy name. Go for it. What's your most worthwhile investment? My business. How so? Without question. I control it. I'm in charge. (laughs) My return on investment is way higher than any other investment. I put no money into it whatsoever. I have a team that does all the work and I basically get to do what I want to do and only what I want to do. What's that investment you don't want to talk about? What's that misstep? Oh, no, no. I made so many of them. I can't even count that high. (laughs) Seriously. 2008. Mm -hmm. So here's the big one. 2007. 
we go to refinance our properties. We had a fairly sizable portfolio in 2007. My um, property manager comes back to me and he says, well, the market softened a little bit. We can't get as much as I thought. Mm. In hindsight, that was the trigger point and we should have just sold it all, right? The market softening is starting to come down. Yeah. Time to sell. I was caught up like everybody else. I yeah. believe the, the ridiculous idea that real estate never comes down. I mean, <laughs> yes, it does. Every 16 years, it comes down. That's the rule. Real estate has a 16-year cycle. Mm. You can look at it over the ages, 16-year cycle, right? It's going to come down. Well, when did it last come down? It came down in 1990. Okay. So 2008, we're overdue. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So there's your 16-year cycle. So that was, oh yeah, that was painful. Well, when life is not painful and life is great and the market corrects and you're on top of the world, what's that guilty spending splurge? What do you like to treat yourself to? Oh, you're looking at it. It's, it's clothes. Mm. I love shopping for clothes. So San Francisco, Nordstrom's, okay. San Francisco. If I'm down in San Francisco, my son lives down in the Bay Area. And if I'm and my wife's son lives in the Bay Area as well. We go to San Francisco. I can count I can absolutely depend that I'm going to dump at least $5,000 on that trip. You know, I got a sideline question. Usually I don't do this in, in WellFit Round, but I like some nice clothes too. Because you are a professional speaker, can you write some of this off or is that a little slippery? Well, I'll tell you, it's not slippery at all. It's pretty black and white. Okay. If it's a uniform, you can write it off. Okay. So if I were to take and put on my very expensive handmade suit, mm -hmm. my company WealthAbility, mm -hmm. It would now not be a <laughs> worth very much, but now it would be a write-off. You right? actually have because to put your uniform. You actually have to put your logo. On, okay, got it. Right. I've actually had. I bought this suit in us. This uh, jacket in Australia. I paid a lot. I never spent so much money on a single jacket. And somebody's asked me about deducting. Yeah, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I just need to put do the wealth Billy logo here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this woman turns to me and she goes, "I beg you." Do not do that to that jacket. <laughs> and it's a beautiful logo. <laughs> Please don't do that. Fair enough. So it can be deductible, but there's a price to pay. Fair enough. Any uh, special routines or uh, rituals or things that you do to get yourself in state or just start your day or end your day? Do you have any special things you do? You know, my wife and I, our mornings together are precious. We get up about four or five in the morning, mm -hmm. every morning. We're morning people. Yep. My wife is a coffee drinker. I mean, she loves her coffee. And I make it, I actually prepare it the night before because otherwise, if I don't get up fast enough, she will make it. And then it's called coffee of desperation. <laughs> and it's not very good. <laughs> so I make coffee of love and she makes coffee of desperation. So we get up, we have our cup of coffee and, you know, we're reading the news. We're talking about probably tax stuff because we're both nerdy about that. And then she goes and does yoga and I go work out. There was a time we were doing yoga together and I just decided I'd, I'd rather run or swim or bike. Actually, yoga is an amazing, it's just amazing. Your concentration goes up so much yeah. with yoga and your breathing gets better. Your heart rate goes down. So I'm a huge believer. It's just finding the time to yeah. do that and the running because I want it. I read a quote the other day. It says, I don't run to add days to my life. I run to add life to my days. Mm. And I particularly am a swimmer. I have a 25 meter pool in my backyard. So if I don't get to swim, I'm, you know, I mean, it's heated during the winter. It's cooled during the summer because I live in Arizona and it's too hot in the summer. That physical exercise yeah. is a big deal to me. So really it's coffee and <laughs> coffee, tax and exercise. <laughs> Not in that order. Or in that order. Uh, it's actually in that order. <laughs> I love it. In that uh order. In, you know, you're incredibly successful. You speak, you fly around the world, you're running a firm you're, or a practice. I'm curious, what have you gotten better at saying no to in the last couple of years? Oh, my heavens. I have such a hard time saying no. Do you? Oh, well, so I'm an approval whore. Hmm. I will pretty much do anything for approval. Ah. So now you know that. That's, okay. That's my secret weakness, right? I'm not, I'm not sure if I approve right. of that, but. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm, at least I know, right? right? At Awareness. least I know. First step. Right? First step. Saying no is really hard to me, but saying no to, to stuff that's not a value mm -hmm. is really big because my time is, as you might imagine, I mean, I run two different businesses any other investing I do, plus I've got grandchildren, plus I've got 
children. Plus, I've got – I'm traveling with Robert all over the world. So my time is really light for everybody, our most precious asset, and it's the one we can never get back. So I learned to say no to a lot more things. The one thing I've not ever been good at saying no to is PR. Mm. <laughs> like this. Yep. Right? Absolutely. I mean, PR is just – it's the lifeblood of a business. So yeah, I'm you with got, you. You just got to do it. I'm with you. Fear. Self-doubt, it often prevents people from you know, being their best self. What do you do when you enter a new area and maybe feel you know, a little anxiety or, or a little extra heartbeat? What do you do to overcome that? You know what? I love partnering with people. And I've had some bad partners. I mean, I've had, I can count three really bad partners. And I've had, right now I have two really, really, really good partners. And there's nothing worse than a bad partner and nothing better than a good partner. But what happens is that if I'm not good at something, I need somebody who is. And so the way what I do is I say, look, help me understand how to do this. The reality is, is if I can, I'm going to have you do it because I'm not a big believer in overcoming weakness. I'm a big believer in focusing on your strength Mm. because we just all have weaknesses. And Why spend the time on the negative when you can spend the time on the positive? So my goal in life is to only do those things that nobody else can do. Yeah. That I am really the only person suitable for them. And I'm constantly looking at, okay, how do I bring in people that can do things that in the past I've been the only person to do it, but maybe I don't have to be. And that includes speaking. That includes PR. That includes marketing. includes all these other things. And so I've actually become a master delegator. Probably my greatest strength is delegation. It's a hard thing to do for somebody who's a straight A student. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. How do you get better? Who do you learn from? How do you get better? Who are your mentors? I learn from everybody. I mean, I learned today, right? I mean, teaching is actually my favorite way of getting better because you learn so much when you teach. We were in the studio today, right? And you go, wow, that's so cool. That's a subtle smile. And I'm going, oh, I just invented that. (laughs) (laughs) And it's a great diagram. Yeah. In fact, I wrote that. I drew that diagram. I'm going, I have to remember that. That is really good. But I find that I learn when I say something that's when I learn is when I'm saying it. So I actually do a lot of my best innovation is through teaching. Got it. Tom, thank you big time for being on the show. I'm super excited for your courses coming out here very shortly. Uh, I'm excited for people to hear the pod. For those that enjoy this and just they got to go check you out and want to continue up with the conversation, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, wealthability.com is the best. Our website's wealthability.com. Or you can listen to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wilwright, And uh, that's my podcast. It's been amazing. The response has been literally has blown me away. And I get comments literally every week from people just writing in or talking to me and saying, yeah. I listen to your podcast. I, had a, I interviewed a n- new staff member yesterday. And he goes, and he starts rattling off all these podcasts that he listened to. And I'm going, yeah. that is so cool. I get he was preparing for an interview. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, he was sincere yeah. about this is such good stuff that nobody's ever said before. I think we all have people that only we can touch. Yeah. And I think it is our obligation to speak our minds. Our friend Robert is very good at speaking his mind, mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes to the detriment. But the reality is, is he's really good at that. And he's been a great example. You ask how I learn and- He's, of course, one of my greatest mentors. And my wife is absolutely phenomenal person. And she's very calm, very yoga. She's very the opposite of me. <laughs> I get really excited. And she says, well, you've got a lot of energy there, Tom. And I do. And that's great. And she's got a lot of calm. It's great to have a team like that. That is great. Well, Tom, I really appreciate you being on the show. And I'm excited to, to be on the journey with you. Same here. Thanks, Dustin. Boom! So many takeaways. You should see my notes. Okay, a couple things that I want to highlight for you just as a reminder so that you can go out there and make use and take action on everything you learn here because this show has the potential to actually make you more money than you thought possible just by doing some tweaks. You actually don't have to go out there and create anything or sell anything or invest in a stock. It's really coming down to your tax strategy. So a couple big takeaways. Number one, 
if you want to pay less taxes, acquire more assets. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I just need to go out and I need to create more. I need to make another investment. I need to start a business. I need to do a side hustle. Yes, these are great things and great strategies, right? Expand your means. However, it gets to a point where you may be spending more time spinning your wheels and actually making less, even though you're working harder because you just don't have the right assets working for you. And I thought Tom's commentary about, you know, I'll just make less money so I can pay less taxes. Yeah, we don't subscribe to that here at at WellFit. And we don't think you should either, right? You should be able to go out and create and do the things that you love to do, place those investments and have a great life and not have to worry about taxes, not be afraid of the IRS. And another big takeaway is financial education. Now, listen, you wouldn't be here unless you were committed, you were interested in upping your game, upping your wealth, getting well fit. And so financial education is the problem. So for those of you that have kids right now, think about what are the things that you're going to pass on to them? What are the things that they need to learn? What are the things that you need to learn? And go check out another pod on the WellFit Podcast Network. Go do a course, right? I know that's self-serving, but go do a course here at WellFit. What are you going to do, whether it's here or reading a book or whatever it is, what are you going to do to increase your financial education? Now, Tom brought up another big takeaway, which was don't be scared of the IRS. And gosh, if you're tax advisor, tax professional is, you may just want to take another second to question it. Now, we're not saying leave the person that you're with that's advising you, but you want to ask them the right questions. And I thought that was interesting. Big, big, big takeaway, double star if you're making notes here, is changing the questions that you ask yourself and maybe you even ask your advisors from, you know, like, what's the best tax write-off? Or, you know, like, which ones am I missing? Instead of that, like saying, how can I write off this iPhone? How could I write off this trip to Indonesia, uh, this potential vacation? Now, again, if you listen to Tom in the show, words matter, intent matters. And coming at certain things, when you ask the question, how can I, or you ask why, why questions, incredibly more powerful. Now, listen, that strategy right there applies to anything in life. We can even leave the subject of taxes, but how can I do something? Or why is it this way? When you ask those questions, it has the power to completely change your life. Another one, I'm looking at my note right now. Two types of people in this world. In the context of the show, Tom was talking about there's two types of attorneys. There are deal makers and deal breakers, right? There are positive minded, happy-go-lucky people, can-do attitudes, and then you're, there are your Debbie Downers. And if, if your name is Debbie, I apologize, but I'm sure you've heard it before. And so <laughs> deal breakers, right? Do you have people that are trying to break the deal? Now, listen, some people out there are trying to protect you, right? They're, you know, If you have substantial means, there are people in place that do that, but you want to be careful. You want to take that second guess and just ask yourself, do I have deal makers on my team or do I have deal breakers And if they are truly afraid of the IRS, this may be a bad strategy. Now, listen, by all means, we're not advocating be super aggressive, do crazy things, and just let someone try to figure it out. We're not saying that, but just coming with that mindset of how can I get creative? What's the way to do that? And putting people on your team that will help you do that. And along with that, I see a side question, a side note that I took here actually The job of your advisor is to ask questions just like a doctor. And so again, no matter what area of your life you're looking to improve, your coach, your mentor, your tax professional, your advisor, your team member, potentially your employee, are they asking the right question? Are they asking and trying to diagnose and get to the situation? I think that was incredibly powerful. I strongly recommend listening to this again. And the reason why is you're going to hear things throughout the day. I was very fortunate to spend time with Tom here in the studio. He's recording courses for us here at WellFit. And I'll tell you, I probably didn't hear things that I heard in the show. And going back and listening to I'm going to pick up something even more. And again, this one show alone has the potential to put more money in your pocket if you will act on it. And the question is, are you going to act on it? We want to know about it. So leave your comments on social Leave it. If you're part of the community on Facebook, the special premium access, leave your commentary there. We'd love to see it. And just in general on our social channels, if you not yet join WealthFit, we'd love to still hear your comments as well. And more importantly, your action items. What are you going to do about it with this information that you've just been given? 
What are you committed to going and taking action on? That's it for now. I am so glad you were here with us today, and I can't wait to have you on the next show. Thanks for listening to this episode of Get Well Fit. Did you have an aha moment or two during the episode? I want to know. Remember, life doesn't pay you for what you know. It pays you for what you do, for the actions you take and the moves you make. So take a second right now and go to getwellfit.com. You'll find a printable recap of this episode, links to things we mentioned in the show, and some exercises that'll help you start taking action on the things you've learned. You can also get in touch with me, Dustin Matthews. That's getwellfit.com. Go there now, and I can't wait to talk with you again on the next episode. Yeah.